This episode was brought to you by Pentester Academy, the leader in online cybersecurity education. Join over 10,000 professionals from 90 countries to learn security online. Also brought to you by Hacker Arsenal, artillery for cyber warriors. Visit us on hackerarsenal.com to check out our latest attack defense gadgets. Hello everyone, I'm Marley Oxenholm from Pentester Academy TV and welcome to our show, Access Point, where we spotlight cybersecurity companies and give an inside look at the people and technology behind the latest advancements in the industry. Today, I will be speaking with the company Awake Security. I'm sitting down right now with Gary Galam, who is co-founder and chief research officer of the company. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Excited I got some to be uh, here. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> I got some great questions here from our tech team. So you ready to get started? I'm I'm ready. All right, let's do, do this. <laughs> All right. So first off, can you tell us about the founding story of Awake Security? How did the founders meet and why did you decide on this idea? Uh, yeah. So so working backwards a little bit. Uh, so the, the company actually, we just launched a product about four months ago. Uh, but the company is about three years old, a little over three years old. Uh, very interesting. This is actually the, the fifth security startup I've been a part of. Okay. Um, but uh, something, something that I've never seen anywhere else is uh, the amount of time we spent doing kind of research and development, um, or I should say research, really understanding uh, sort of enterprises and problems and, and the users of this particular type of product. Um, and so uh, what, we, what we found, kind of what led to sort of the genesis of the company, mm -hmm. right, very early on, we, we discovered what we now call, in hindsight, the 45-minute arc. So uh, as we went out there, we, we saw across, it almost didn't, didn't matter what kind of vertical, right? Uh, mm -hmm. we, you know, we saw this in, in healthcare, finance, energy, retail, um, all different types of sizes of teams, uh, sophistication levels of teams, but a very tight average of about uh, 45 minutes per alert investigation. Okay. Right? So you have no shortage of technologies out there that are doing security things mm -hmm. and ultimately telling you, hey, go go look over here. You may have missed something. Um, and as we know, there's an enormous amount of those what we may call alerts. But across the board, when you see uh, people you know, taking about 45 minutes, you kind of do the math. Uh, average analyst and you know, average shift uh, gets through about 10 to 15 investigations okay. per day, right? And so we know that 10 to 15 per person just doesn't come close to cutting it. Right. Um, and so that's what, that's what first really animated us as a company and actually really led us to, to go into that research phase that, that I was talking about there. Okay. Um, because the big question was, well, why 45 minutes? Why so long? Uh, and one of, the, you know, one of the striking things that we found uh, immediately was, uh, on average, uh, analysts, again, across all these different types of companies and organizations, have to look at about 35 different tools mm -hmm. to do the work. Right? Okay. And so uh, that ends up being a very, actually, very kind of destructive uh, reality on on the workflow, but uh, one of the things that became very interesting, uh, even for me at a personal level, mm -hmm. was as we dug into trying to understand, okay, well, not only why does it take so long, but what is the effect of you know these these different technologies that people mm -hmm. have to look at to, to go through the, pr the process. Um, one of the things that was very shocking to see was. And, and I should say, you know, this could happen because of the enterprise okay. where, where the analyst is working, or maybe this happened in the analyst's past and they carry scars forward into, you know, future roles. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're an analyst and you've ever been wrong, meaning you've made the call, you get an alert, you mm -hmm. get something that says, hey, there's something bad over here, and you say, yes, I agree with that, and, and we're going to take this laptop away from you, right, right? and bring mm -hmm. it back and, and have it cleaned up. Um, and it can be discovered that you as an analyst were wrong, that what you say is on the laptop mm -hmm. is not there. So um, you learn really fast never to make that mistake again, because when you agree with an alert, you're basically interrupting a business process. You're okay. stopping somebody's work, and you're saying, we're going to take this, and we're going to remediate, we're going to fix it. That. I see. Um, and uh, so, 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 yeah, so if you've been wrong, you learn don't ever do that again. What's shocking is not only is this process very slow, very error prone, um, but analysts are actually incentivized not to take action. 
at really? the end of it because of that. Yeah, it's wow. very, very interesting thing to see. So, uh, so it was these these combinations of things that that really, like I said, kind of animated the company into into existence. Okay. Yeah. And now, what would you say your target, you know, market is? Uh, so, so definitely more on the enterprise side yeah. of the house. Uh, a lot of times, I use the term analyst or SOC, and and I, I use those terms very interchangeably, which just security team. If you have people that that are doing the defensive work of trying to, uh, you know, investigate and make decisions mm -hmm. about you know, what needs to be remediated or or not, that's you know, any any organization with those types of functions is is who we work very closely with. Okay, yeah. gotcha. And now, I know it sounds like the number of tools required by an analyst could be a problem, but if those tools are well-selected and industry-leading tools, doesn't that help? Uh, yeah. so, uh, so in theory, mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, but, but what we found during you know, our investigation, and we, we continue to refine this, is in practice, no. Really? Um, yeah, and so, so some of the reasons are mm, maybe a little more obvious, if you will, like, you know, we may hear people in the industry talk about issues around them. Uh, so, you know, one, one of the more kind of obvious reasons is uh, it, 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 it makes the process very error prone, right? When you have to look at one tool that, that only does you know, this much mm -hmm. of the function you need to accomplish. Right. Um, and so you, you work within that and then you have to kind of remember you know what was what was interesting and relevant from there, and you kind of do this jumping between tools. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that tends to, and we actually documented this in a very interesting way. Um, it, it, it creates a problem where what's funny is, you know, for a lot of people, it's just you need to be such an expert, not necessarily mm -hmm. in the craft of security, mm -hmm. but in the nuances of tools, right? And so as you go from tool to tool to tool, um, small errors at one point in your, your thought process can snowball through that process. Okay. And, um, it's, it's something that more recently I've been referring to as the uh, human centipede, centipede problem. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know if we edit that out. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's what you see. You see yeah. the, the, the uh, tail end of mm -hmm. one tool becomes the input for the next and, and on down the line. It's right? all connected, yeah. Yeah, but, there, but there's actually more interesting subtle problems. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, one is actually this kind of gets into the uh, to that that year and a half of investigation and research okay. that, that we did, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when I say we we did investigation research, I mean that got down to the level not just of analyzing workflows, but even like cognitive profiling analysts oh, wow. and really understand, okay. yeah, really understanding um, not just the type of information people need, but how they work with that information, right? So mm -hmm. how we can present that to them better and, and and give them a tool that supports the way you naturally work and think, right? Okay. Right. Um, so, so people are familiar with, uh, you know, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, right? These are kind of qualities of, mm -hmm. of how you you analyze the world. Um, there's a characteristic that's even more important for anyone in that analyst analysis type position, and, and that's something that you know, fewer people are familiar with. But um, it's called uh, flexibility of closure. Mm. So, so just as a side, uh, flexibility of closure is uh, basically your ability to find patterns in information that you are presented with. Okay. Right? So if you have a high flexibility closure, the way you could think about that is uh, you tend to find patterns in data that a lot of other people miss. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that is, um, I guess you know, another way to think about this is, if you have a fl high degree of flexibility closure, you have a very high bar for stopping yourself mentally um, in certain types of, of thought exercise. Right? So if you're looking at data and you start connecting, mm -hmm. say connecting dots, looking for patterns in there, somebody with a low degree of flexibility closure will stop themselves prematurely. Go, oh, this doesn't make sense. It can't be right. Somebody mm -hmm. with a high degree will actually continue connecting those dots and ultimately tend to find patterns that other people miss. All right. The subtle problem with that mm -hmm. human centipede problem, if you will, the 35 tool problem is that for flexibility closure to work, the information needs to be in front of you. So if you switch right. tabs, that's not a flexibility closure problem anymore. That's a memorization problem. Can oh, you remember okay. between different sources, right? Now that's single tabs, or that's different tabs in a single product. Now when you start dividing across products, you know you just basically decimate the the human's ability to make really effective decisions. Right. Um, a more interesting, I shouldn't say more interesting problem, but an interesting problem that we've started to uh, see across enterprises more recently is it also creates a kind of siloing of skills. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming very common to go into teams where you see people who you have you know, one person or a couple of people where they work on Splunk. 
Mm -hmm. That's it. They know Splunk. And that's it. And that's it. They don't know the other tools, right, as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so what's interesting about that is you have single workflows looking at a single type of threat that are now not only split across multiple tools, but they're split across multiple people. Wow. And so, you know, you, you can start to extrapolate mm-hmm. based on what we were just talking yeah. about, the, the effects of that, right? Um, and it's interesting because those divisions now, they're not even by, they're not even on something sensical, like maybe types of threat. Right. You know? Instead, they're, they're, these divisions in the workflow exist by type of product or wow. even features in a product, depending on the size of team. So, yeah, definitely uh, a cascade of problems that come from the, uh, from just the, you know, regardless of your selection of tools, mm-hmm. just the volume of tools we have. And, and kind of a, another sort of side note there that's sort of interesting yeah. about this is um, when we talk about 35 different tools, mm-hmm. fundamentally within the enterprise, you, you have three main data sets that you work off of that you're going to do your protection or your detection or your analysis and mm-hmm. things like that, right? It's, it's basically the, the network, the endpoint, or aggregated logs, which is yeah. arguably kind of a subset of the first two, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you can start to see how, you know, we as an industry have created a lot of technologies that are very acutely focused yes. on a very specific thing within one of these data sets. And so you need lots of different tools looking mm-hmm. at the exact same data, which in effect, you know, end up hurting the, the kind of the, the workflows right. and processes and, and the efforts of the humans trying That's, to ultimately make a decision. Yeah. And you need the right so. people as well that know all that as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which creates other problems. Yes. I yeah, can yeah. see that. So that leads into my next question. Doesn't automation solve the problem? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of some of the rhetoric right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so look, automation, yes, absolutely mm-hmm. solves some problems. Okay. Um, I think we need to be very realistic with ourselves as yeah. an industry. Um, automation also creates other problems. Really? Right? Tell me more about that. And so, okay, so, um, you know, first of all, you know, what is automation good for? It's it's good for, and this doesn't just apply to cybersecurity or InfoSec, right? Exactly. This applies to you know, industries that, that have been exploring automation since you know, early industrial revolution, mm-hmm. right? Um, the things you can automate are things you understand extremely well, okay. right? So if you understand the problem and you understand the solution to it extremely well, you can automate that. Um, and so there are a number of what we might call low-hanging fruit type mm-hmm. problems that exist, you know, within uh, within security teams, or, or I should say, there's uh, problems that security teams are regularly addressing that are are you know of these low-hanging fruit type. We, those types of things we can automate, right? right? Things that are are very clear, very repetitive, very mundane, um, don't have a lot of ambiguity to them. Actually, have almost no ambiguity mm-hmm. to them. Okay. That's that's great for automation. Um, the other side of automation, though, is that it actually does create other issues. And so okay. one of the issues that, that um, I've written a little bit about, but um, you can think of it, we call it the leftover principle, right? So, mm-hmm. so you automate the, the easy things, the simple things. Well, what's left over? The harder things. Right. right? So, so a lot of teams are already having problems you know, finding people to you know, fulfill the, the responsibilities of the team. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we're seeing is automation is actually making the job that's left over. Uh, it's only the difficult things. I see. And, and what's kind of interesting about that is you get good at the difficult things by sort of maintaining a level of familiarity also with the building blocks, mm-hmm. right? the, the simpler things. Um, and what's interesting is the, the way we've see this, seen this start to kind of manifest itself in enterprises is uh, for the teams that are highly, highly automated, and we've seen some really impressive programs out there, um, they've really slowed down in terms of output, in terms mm. of the, the bad things they're finding. And it's not that there aren't any bad things to find anymore. Um, what we're seeing when you start to, to, to get down into it is that these teams are very optimized uh, around, basically around the effort to automate as opposed to focusing on the efficacy oh, of okay. people and the decisions they make, right? Because those other problems, the harder problems where we start getting into, say, insiders or, um, you know, more of those behavioral type mm, okay. problems, mm-hmm. uh, those are the things we can't automate, right? But, right. but the, the technology available to, to support these types of uh, issues is not really kept up. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah. 
And uh, now was, that leads to my next one. That I was going to say, doesn't machine learning fill the gap of automating the types of problems that are not as well understood and addressed by more traditional automation? Uh, yeah, so, so machine learning is an interesting one. Yeah. Um, so machine learning, it's funny, over the past, I don't know if it's six months, 12 months or so, um, machine learning and, and automation conversations have been really, you know, the line between the two has, has blurred yes. a lot, right? Um, and so, you know, from, from the ML side of things, uh, in certain ways that, ca that can sell machine learning short, um, because machine learning is capable of some, some pretty phenomenal uh, yeah. you know, s results that we, we didn't have the ability to execute as well you know, earlier in the history of InfoSec, right? So, so identifying certain types of objects or certain types of behavior is ultimately based on like fuzzy statistical patterns. Mm. Um, machine learning does that. It does that in very, very well defined well-structured problems. So, uh, you know, prior to Awake, I was at Silence, and uh, there's other, you know, other other vendors out there, some in the EDR space, some others that have taken uh, ML and really focused it on, you know, a very well-structured problem. And the results they've achieved are, are amazing. Hmm, okay. Um, however, I do think that a lot of those companies are the exception. Um, and you see this when you look at the industry. There, are, uh, I think, I think a larger number of companies that have really launched themselves as AI or ML companies. And when you look at their uh, messaging, you know, a couple of years later, they've totally, you know, refocused and reshifted. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, uh, because, you know, from what we can gather, they're not, you know, not delivering on on kind of the promise of ML. Um, and the reason for that ultimately is that. ML actually does have a lot of similarities to the uh, to the automation mm -hmm. in the context of this conversation, and that is, it's also for well understood, well defined, well structured problems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? It, it doesn't it doesn't solve problems for you that you can't uh, already sort of define you know the uh, a path to a solution for. Um, and so, uh, so ML, yeah, no, it does. It does have pros and cons. What's, what's actually kind of interesting, also in the context of this type of conversation, is for the well-defined problems, ML can do some some fantastic things, and we we use it that way mm -hmm. within within our product, very in a very focused way. Um, but ML pro applied broadly to threat and threat behavior can actually, instead of reducing the need for people, create the need for more people. Really? Because, yeah, so the types of things that, that you know, if you get too fuzzy <laughs> with mm -hmm. your definitions, it starts identifying uh, not necessarily a whole lot more, but a different type of activity huh. that's a lot more difficult for the analyst to validate than analysts have historically had to deal with, right? It's not the type of thing where you can, Take some pattern and plug it into Google or Threat Exchange or you know whatever you use right. and get an answer back. It becomes more of identifying what may be business justified versus not business justified, and so I think that's where where things have kind of gone sideways on, on some of these types of solutions. Okay, yeah. and uh, so I know that other vendors might claim to do the same thing. What makes a wake security solution different? You know, talking about ML. Mm -hmm. You know, even after ML, right? After automation, uh, after what are you, statistical anomaly detection, after Bayesian, blah, 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 right? yep. after all these things uh, that we tend to hear vendors talking about in the mm -hmm. industry, there still remains the fundamental original problem unchanged almost over time. And that is that the work the analyst needs to do is it's error prone. It's actually highly error prone. And it's frequently inconclusive, like fundamentally that's the problem, right? Wow. Like, for years and years and years, we've focused on you know, different detection methodologies. My detection's better than your detection, and you know, we, we see we see the re see the results of that, right? Mm -hmm. But the analyst is still left kind of holding the bag, right, right? As we shift from one methodology to the next to the next, right? And so, uh, so to us, the solution is uh, could be thought of as integration, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, but. You know, I would throw caution around that word. Not integration in the way the industry uses this term, because to me, the, w the way the industry uses this term is very much uh, like we were sort of joking about earlier. You know, the uh, tailpipe of one, yep. you know, one, right one solution gets tied into the input of the next, and we just chain these things together. Yep. Right? Um, <clears throat> rather, I would, you know, I would think of that concept of integration more as the consolidation of functions that uh, are required 
to address a range of uh, security relevant concerns, mm -hmm. right? So insider threat, outsider threat, yep. malware, non-malware, right? Uh, you know, nation state, organized crime, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, accidental insider, right? Um, there are fundamental <clears throat> uh, requirements from an investigative perspective that, that exist across all these different types of problems. Um, and so part one of that is to consolidate but the second part of that um, is unlike the way we've done it, where you see these divisions kind of forming in security teams right, by product, if you will, um, almost based on feature, mm -hmm. instead of really, let's get down to, let's, let's simplify things and boil it down. You have the three main data sets that you're working from, right? network, endpoint, aggregated logs. Um, and let's look at each of those individually mm -hmm. and, and apply you know, the, these fundamental techniques to a single data set to address the widest range of problems at the end of the day, uh, which is, it turns out, and, and I'll show you this, like, you know, we can, we can sit here and talk about this all day long, but in a demo format, like to me, you know, mm -hmm. if a picture speaks a thousand words, then a series of moving pictures, you know, speak a million. <laughs> yep. um, and that's, you know, that's where you really see the rubber meet the road on, on this kind of conversation. Okay, very cool. Yeah. And uh, now, can you talk about your product in more detail for me, specifically your custom-built analytics stack, the security knowledge graph, Entity IQ, and Activity IQ? Yes. All right. So, uh, so we got a few concepts in there, yeah. but we, we can actually kind of put them all together and sort of understand them uh, at a higher level. And I'll go into this during demo more technically. Cool, okay. um, but uh, uh, it kind of goes. Actually, it's just the tail end of what we were just talking about a minute mm -hmm. ago, right? Mm -hmm. So. What you, know, what you identified there are sort of different areas of the system that take on uh, different responsibilities of that, you know, the fundamental tasks that need to be performed uh, when ultimately trying to make a decision. Um, so you'll see, you know, it, it, there's in the work to be done, mm -hmm. um, there's parts of the work that machines can do really, really well. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of the sifting and kind of, you know, statistical analysis, all those, all those types of things, right? But the ultimate decision making, you know, the, I mean, one thing that we've just figured out over time is mm -hmm. except for the obvious cases where you can sort of block something in real time, um, the remainder of the decisions to be made kind of come down to business justified or not business justified and issues like that. And so we find that there's, there's things that humans just in, intrinsically, implicitly do better than mm -hmm. machines and vice versa. Um, okay, so uh, what we've done is, and part of the reason we did such a long investigative phase was we really wanted to understand how a wide range of people work across mm -hmm. a wide range of um, use cases or issues or mm -hmm. problems that they're trying to address. And so we captured, uh, like I said, those sort of the lowest common denominator tasks, right? And so applying this now, kind of come a step down. Uh, the data set that we're working off of today, right now, that we we focused most heavily on, I should say, is mm -hmm. is the network, um, network data. So there's, it turns out, there's an enormous amount, enormous amount of information and intelligence that you can extract out of your network that we, that just hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. There's there's tasks, there's things that machines do well, right, and things that humans humans do better. Right? Mm -hmm. um, now, refocusing on the data set, there's th there's also okay, so there's problems that. Uh, a lot of people have thought, you need logs to solve. And right. it turns out that actually that information, the information that you are, in many cases, currently trying to extract from logs, also, in full, exists on the network. Exists on the network with actually a lot more detail and a lot more context. Um, it's a lot more work to extract, and it's a lot more analytics to do something with. Right. Right? Logs are actually uh, a lot easier in a lot of ways, and this surprises people because you know, when you look at a lot of log-based solutions, these enormous data stores, and we hear you know we hear about that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. On the network, uh, you can average it out to about three times more data on the network than you get you know in logs. In some cases, a lot more. So just the scale problem is enormous. Um, but secondly, even though it's true there is more data or there's mm -hmm. more detail and more context on the network, uh, it's 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 separated more. You don't get a single log entry. Right? Now you're getting data from multiple sources, multiple protocols, multiple applications that needs to be tied together. So it is a harder problem to solve. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately, where where Awake uh, kind of diverged from the industry was saying, look, you have you have your network. Like the data is there, whether you're using it or not. Um, but we're going to focus on, you know, really 
taking advantage of the information that, that you do have, you could be doing a lot more with. And so by putting a device there, plugging it in, mm -hmm. and you know, besides giving an IP address, you can know, walk away, we do the rest. You know, wow. okay. Instead of you needing to plug in logs and plug in all kinds of other data mm -hmm. sources, we do the heavy lifting to figure out what would have been in the logs, and in many cases, a lot more information that you just would never see in the logs. Okay. So. And uh, I know you touched upon this briefly, but you said your website mentions that you track devices, users, and domains using only network traffic. I know most of the user information is in the application layer, so how does your product handle encrypted traffic analysis? <laughs> all right. So, uh, so actually, there's multiple questions there. Um, first of all, just look, look, I mean, let's take encryption head on. Mm -hmm. um, we love, love, love encryption. Um, uh, encryption is actually, we, we've identified multiple types of compromises because uh, encryption was in play. So, uh, you know, when we talk about encryption, uh, especially on the network, it's, it's, not a, it's actually not this vague, nebulous thing. It's a very specific thing, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about encryption on the network, really we're talking about an implementation, right? So this, like SSL is an example. Um, there are a handful of SSL libraries out there, not a huge number, right? A uh, much bigger number of applications that use these specific libraries, mm -hmm. right? Um, but when you look at the, you know, well, let's continue with that for a minute, right? So as an application developer, and you're going to say you're going to use one of these libraries, you mm -hmm. invoke the library, you set up whatever options need to be set up for, you know, the, the, the type of traffic that, you know, or whatever the, the goal is of your mm -hmm. particular application. Um, and we actually see that. We see artifacts of that on the network. So from just the characteristics of an encrypted tunnel, we can separate applications and we can start to tell what types of applications okay. um, are putting that that traffic on the network um, a very simple example you know we think about browsers browsers mm -hmm. tend to be very forward leaning when yes. it comes to encryption best practices right and so they that traffic really separates itself from uh, say some type of background updater or piece of malware that that's not configured you know, right. to, the, to the same level right um, so so that's uh, one way of thinking about it that's just encryption on face value from the from the outside, from mm -hmm. the characteristics of the tunnel, you can actually tell a lot. There's a lot more you, you could do with that. Um, but you know, also to your question about, well, what about the information? Yeah. You know, I'm talking about tracking people and devices, and, and again, you'll, you'll see this in a lot more detail. Um, yes, it's true that uh, a lot of uh, traffic's encrypted. First of all, continuing from what we were just talking about, uh, even the uh, even the encrypted traffic itself becomes helpful for us tracking devices. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, the most accurate aspects of tracking that we can do um, is because of encrypted traffic. Okay. Um, and then there's also the thing that uh, people are surprised by how much traffic actually is not actually encrypted on the network. There's, there's just a lot of uh, other types of protocols that as network analysts, you know, security-focused people, we as an industry have not spent a lot of time focused on, maybe because there's not a lot of exploits that, that uh, you know, target uh, particular problems or vulnerabilities in those mm -hmm. protocols. So we tend to, to really understand the protocols that are, you know, highly exploitable mm -hmm. or uh, highly leveraged for C2 and things like that. The rest of them, yeah, they don't, you know, they don't affect a lot of people. Right. So, um, so we haven't become as familiar with them. But it turns out that it's those sources that have a gold mine of information for the security analyst actually to you know to get the information that they're struggling to get out of other sources um, so anyway it's kind of a whirlwind of an answer there. no that was great it was great <laughs> and now I'm curious does your product handle enterprise grade IOT devices as well and do you deal with that traffic differently yeah. uh, okay awesome um, I, you know I should have I should have said something about that already. Uh, yeah, so that's, you know, when, when, when you get on the network, mm -hmm. that's kind of the point, right? On the network, you get to see everything that you can't put an agent on, right. that you don't have administrative access to, uh, that comes into your environment you know, very temporarily, right? Things like that. Um, so IoT devices, absolutely, right? From, a, from an analytics perspective, you know, we start with the network, and the mm -hmm. network is made up of endpoints, right? And so, uh, you know, one of the very first... Uh, challenges that we need to solve that you know happens sort of underneath the hood is uh, you know you can think about it this way uh, for for every every session we see come in we have to make a decision we have to say the session I see right here on this IP address mm -hmm. does this session is this coming from the device that was on this IP address just a moment ago 
Or does a session belong to a new device that has now come over and taken this IP address? And if that's the case, did this new device exist in the organization before, somewhere else, and now I need to know that this device has a new IP address and it's over mm -hmm. here now? Or is this an entirely new device, right? Um, and so just in the process of starting to solve issues like that, of course, you know, IoT is actually a much easier problem for us, right? Because mm -hmm. IoT doesn't move around you know, right. typically, right? And, and even if they use DHCP, they tend to get the same, same IP addresses. And, and so, so when it comes to tracking and identifying IoT, it's a, it's a much easier problem for us than, than others, like a normal you know, user's laptop that moves mm -hmm. around and you're in a conference room one hour, right. and, you know, some other conference room on the other side of the building another hour, and your IP is constantly changing. Um, but look, as an analyst, uh, that's just the first part of the problem you know, that, that you are repetitively solving, which is you, know, you think about this from a workflow perspective. Very frequently, you get an alert. Mm -hmm. It gives you an IP address before you can even start doing the fun stuff you know, you have to answer all the basic questions. Well, what device is this? Yep. Right? Well, where has this device been? I need to look at a longer period of time to start figuring out, does this make sense? Does mm -hmm. it not make sense? Right? It's all the business justified. Yep, a lot of background work first. Right? So, so that's just, you know, step one is just resolving what's there and where it's been. But step two is what's normal? What's abnormal? What's normal for this device? What's normal for devices like this device? How is this device different from devices like this device? Right? Um, and so that's where we start getting to some of these other layers of analytics that we were talking about a little mm -hmm. bit ago, entity IQ, activity IQ. So you can think of uh, the knowledge graph as mm -hmm. just identifying the things that are on the network okay. and the relationships between them. Um, and then entity IQ is the concept of where we start going in and telling you, doing the work, uh, that you typically see, you know, kind of like world-class you know, level uh, uh, analysts or investigators do, and that is, without pre-existing knowledge, figure out what's normal, you know, for for this environment. Figure mm -hmm. out what's normal for devices like that device, and then figure out how this device separates itself from those types of profiles. Um, and so that happens, and and in the context of IoT, it's actually a, a simpler problem. Also, because right? yeah. IoT can be very, uh, you know, it's it's like uh, you know, process control, domain, you know, SCADA type type traffic, right? It's any sort of deviation becomes interesting, and mm -hmm. that's it's a bit of an easier problem, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. So, cool. So yes. So yes to IoT. <laughs> nice. Nice. And uh, so now I'm assuming that if you're parsing all traffic, then real time detection would be difficult to achieve. How does your solution address that? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so um, so we do, I don't think I mentioned it, but we, on top of all this other stuff we do, we have a full packet capture system, so we record okay. everything, so you know, you have historical data, nice. you can go back, and I mean, as an as an investigative system, that's, it's a prerequisite, mm -hmm. right? Like, the, the thing that, to me, the thing that separates an investigative system from all other types is all other types, detection, protection, and, and you know, gradients of those things, they ultimately need to make a decision about the type of data they're going to keep for okay. you to you know, look at later, mm -hmm. for them to do analysis on, right? And so, so there's some data is kept, some data is not. Mm -hmm. um, now that, to me, it basically precludes it from being an investigative type of system, right? Because invest in an investigation process, uh, which is to say every single alert you look into, you don't know what data you're going to need and not need. So you can't create these rules in advance that say, right. oh, I don't need you know, certain types of data because you don't know that's true. Um, all right. So we have all the data. Um, but as, as, as you allude to, yeah, in, in processing that real time uh, is a challenge. And so mm -hmm. uh, one of, I think one of the other thing, one of the other reasons that, that uh, we spent uh, such a long time developing the solution before, before launching it is we did initially look at other solutions out in the industry for, uh, for doing certain aspects yeah. of, of the work we needed to do right now. We didn't want to have to build this system end to end for packet processing all the way through database and analytics mm -hmm. and, and, and everything in between. Um, but when we analyzed the pre-existing solutions out there, uh, you know, we found that it's just very, very difficult to get them to uh, perform Really? In, the, in the way we, you know, we expected them to perform for the amount of work that we were going to expect from these things. So, so yes, we ultimately did need to create that, that network parsing engine by ourselves. Um, the funny thing about this is, and you know, this kind of starts to get into sort of the, the unique characteristics of Awake that, mm -hmm. that I just have never seen before, is um, the team that was assembled 
to create this solution is, is phenomenal. And so, you know, as it, re as it relates to this question, um, the people that we had working on that network parsing engine, mm -hmm. they, weren't, uh, they weren't necessarily just, you know, network developers or engineers who had done packet processing in the past. Yeah. Um, that effort was really led by three PhDs in language design. Really? Right? Not what you'd expect. No, okay. I'm surprised. So, so uh, well, it, it, this was, again, this is, I've ne never seen this before, so it was phenomenal for me to watch this unfold. But um, for them, it was an I.O. problem, right? So, you know, we, we spent time talking about, you know, traffic and protocols and right. sort of the, the boundedness of the problem, if you will. But ultimately, they were approaching it as an I.O. problem. So okay. the input packets off the wire, the output First of all, it was very interesting. As in any other system you look at, it's packets off the wire input, packets off the wire output. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, as an analyst, you don't care about packets. Right? You care about what's going on ultimately inside of sessions. You care about data types. You care about activities, behaviors, things true, like that. Right? Like, that's just the envelope. Right? Um, and so uh, they actually built a system optimized for the analytics that come much later in the pipe. I mean, so from, from the very beginning, the parsing, of the traffic that's ultimately put you know, onto disk before it even ends up in databases and before analytics is uh, being applied to it. It was optimized, that output was optimized for what's gonna happen later on. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, know, you, have, you have aspects like that uh, all the way to the other end of the system, which is, so we ended up, and <laughs> this was something I learned much later on, but the, the database we created for the system uh, is ultimately, it's a type of data index list database, but, but it was ultimately the type of thing that's been theorized about mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, some academic journals, but has not been developed at the scale uh, that, that was developed here within Awake. Right? Right. So, so end to end, um, we put a lot of effort into actually the performance of the system. And, and there's kind of that goal of achieving close to real time performance, right. which you know, it's fine, right? Or not, because the reality is whether, you know, whether you're real time, whether you're 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes behind, very few people will ever see, you know, the difference. But where this matters, and this really is another thing that emerged out of uh, doing such a deep analysis mm -hmm. of the users of the system and of enterprises and their workflows, um, performance really, really, really matters. So in our industry, we joke a lot about things like coffee break performance, okay. right? So you sit in front of your console, you issue a query or you ask a question of the product, uh, and then you go get coffee, and then you come back and you see if the results are ready. Okay. Right? So very, very common across a lot of different types of systems. All right, the problem with that is when you're trying to make a decision about something, especially in a security context, especially mm -hmm. when the stakes are high, and they're, all, they're almost always high, right? Because it goes back to the analyst being incentivized to take action or not. Mm -hmm. you know, the decision I'm making is, am I going to take your system away from you, you know, kick off whatever political battles are going to come after that or not? Mm -hmm. um, and so to be confident in answering that question, typically you have a lot of questions you're trying to answer. But if you're sitting behind a system that has coffee break performance, you know, and you have 10 questions, you're not going to ask 10 questions. Mm -hmm. You're going to ask one or two. You're right. Gonna, you're going to pick, hopefully pick the right one or two, and that's it. And we, again, we, we documented this almost across the board. So performance is extremely important. Like, the system needs to be able to return results in seconds. And, and be, if not, like, it has a very negative effect, actually, on the decisions that people ultimately make. So it, like, it changes, you know, performance changes, fundamentally changes the behavior of mm -hmm. the person using the system, like can fundamentally alter the way investigation is done. Wow. That's incredible so, that you built that end to end yeah. as well. My gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it was, I mean, we should do a follow up session just on the team because to me that's like one of the most phenomenal aspects of the company is like, again, the, the team here is, is amazing. That's so, incredible. Yeah, yeah. And now I know you touched upon this briefly, but I know your website mentions that Awake is the only solution that allows searches for network entity behaviors rather mm. than just primitive indicators. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that for me? Yeah. So, um, so this is something I'll try to, sh I'll, I'll try to remember to show during, during the demo too, or, or zero in on. Um, but, you know, you could think of primitive behaviors as anything that can be enumerated from a single session. Okay. Right, and so uh, pretty much almost, almost, almost all of the network uh, solutions out there are very session focused. So any question you ask of the system, um, 
really, you know, you're, you're limited almost by what takes place in, in a single session. Now, there's, right. there's a whole spectrum of how deep you can go, you know, depending on the, the type of system you're looking at. Um, but the reality is, you know, especially as time goes on and the types of threats we're looking for are more behavioral-based, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, abuse of, of credentials, right? Now you need to separate what's what seems to be normal use versus abnormal right. use. Um, and that's a really simple, simple high-level example. But uh, to be able to make those types of decisions, it's it's frequently not, you know, you're not going to get the information you need in a single session. Right. Um, you're going to need to, you need, you know, require the ability to ask questions um, that span uh, mul- basically time. Um, and so uh, not just time, but, but also, you know, other maybe higher order characteristics of systems, right? So, uh, think of an example here, like, uh, there's there's examples we show of where, you know, knowing screen resolution is, is relevant, mm-hmm. or uh, certain types of applications that are on systems. And, and in a lot of cases, you, you don't get to know that information from a single session. Right. So it's it's information that we derive about systems over time, but then, allow you to ask questions about those characteristics of systems. So, so it's kind of neat. You'll, you'll, see a, you'll see a cool example of that. Yeah, that's cool. I'm excited. Right. Thank so. you so much for speaking with me today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This Absolutely. Was exciting to be in the studio. Wonderful. So, thanks. And that's all the time we have for today, so be sure to tune in next time for another episode of Access Point. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook so you don't miss out on any of the latest cybersecurity news. This episode is brought to you by Pentester Academy, the leader in online cybersecurity education. Join over 10,000 professionals from 90 countries to learn security online. Also brought to you by Hacker Arsenal, artillery for cyber warriors. Visit us on hackerarsenal.com to check out our latest attack defense gadgets. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.